Oh my good lord. There are so many people right now just agonizing wicked hard over the comic book industry. Every single one of them wondering what could possibly go wrong next. Well there, Mr. Man, don't you worry. Because <laughs> I'm about to tell you. Hey there, Bubby. Welcome to Shanghala. My name is Duke, and this, and this video is my list of 20 amazing predictions, 20 things I guarantee will happen within the comic book industry between now and San Diego Comic-Con 2021. Now, in large part, this video is a response to Perch, who just did a similar comic book predictions video. So, yeah, I'm kind of stealing his basic idea. But I will say, if you are a comic book fan and you are not subscribed to the Comics by Perch channel here on YouTube, you should do that right now. Well, I mean, not right now. You should totally watch this video and like, share, subscribe, comment, do all the groovy things. But once you've done that, yes, you, you should rush right over and subscribe to Comics by Perch. You see, he offers what I find to be some of the most reasoned, most thoughtful commentary on the comic book industry to be found today, and all served up with none of the clickbaity, sky is falling, everything sucks rhetoric that seems to permeate so much of the other YouTube channels that focus on comics. Uh, anyway, that said, let's not waste any time. Let's get right to the predictions with... Number one. DC Comics will drop... UCS. So, uh, as you probably know, DC recently kicked Diamond Comics distribution to the curb when the response of that longtime monopoly to the COVID kerfuffle turned out to be a major kink in the hose, interrupting its cash flow. DC instead threw in with two new startup distributors. One is Lunar, which is a division of Discount Comic Book Service, and that seems to have worked out eh, pretty well. And why not? I mean, DCBS is a mail-order subscription service, so it was pretty easy to level up to go from shipping comic books to individual retail customers to supplying comic book shops on a wholesale basis. But the other new partner was UCS, which is a division of Midtown Comics. And from the perspective of many comic book stores, including my local shop, well, that service has been a disaster. Now, admittedly, DC deserves much of the blame for that. Initially, shops were going to have a choice. They could go with one of the new distributors, depending on which pawn they were closest to, or they could stay with Diamond. But then, and I don't know what happened behind the scenes to prompt this, DC, without warning, threw a switch and made an immediate change. No transition period at all. Like, literally none. DC decided it wanted everybody off the Titanic stat. No taking time to put on a life vest. No pausing to hear the band bust out one last song. It was everybody over the rails right now. And eh, hopefully you land in one of the two life rafts we've set up. Well, <laughs> one of the rafts is a leaky boat. And that's UCS. UCS just could not ramp up fast enough. Seemingly, it just it didn't have the infrastructure. And that's probably because its parent company is not a distributor of any kind. Midtown Comics is just... A comic book store. I mean, granted, it's a very, very, very large comic book store, but still just a comic book store. And the result was that UCS had some trouble creating and accommodating all those new wholesale accounts DC threw at it at once. And many local stores, including the one I shop at, did not get any DC comics for as long as six weeks after the Diamond Channel shut down. And even now, UCS is still shorting orders, still screwing up, it offers no customer service to speak of, and worst of all, shops are paying more for shipping than they did through Diamond, and yet are still getting damaged books. <laughs> and so, I predict that by this time next year, DC will have gone to Midtown and said, uh, guys, thanks for all you've done. You really helped us out. Hey, here are some exclusive variants, but uh, good luck in all your future endeavors. <laughs> And at that point, it will ask Lunar to expand to national distribution. And Lunar will do that, and I predict, most likely by leasing space in Amazon and or Walmart distribution centers. And why that might be will become clear in some of my other predictions. But first... Number two. 
the diamond defections will continue. So, so far, only two companies, DC and Alterna Comics, which is a company I very much enjoy, by the way, and highly recommend to you, only those two have bailed on Diamond. And I think that's because, so far, other publishers really have no alternative, not unless they want to go the Alterna route and plunge into self-distribution. But I think Diamond is so bad that more companies will follow suit. I mean, Diamond has been a disinterested cluster fudge for years, decades, but it was the only game in town. And so publishers and comic shops alike could really only just throw up their hands and say, Neh, what are you going to do? But now <laughs> the Titanic is going down fast. When Diamond President Steve Jeppe said coming out of COVID that our comeback will be bigger than our setback, well, that's true only if he meant we intend to screw this pooch harder than we ever have before. <laughs> <laughs> and I think when it finally gets to the point of self-preservation, some publishers will indeed dive over the rails into whatever waits below. Who will that be? Probably not Marvel. Marvel just seems paralyzed by corporate inertia. It seemingly does not dare do anything without a mother may I from Disney. And Disney, I'm not sure Disney even knows Marvel exists outside of pictures that move. So I think it not unlikely that Disney would simply choose to stop publishing monthly comics altogether before it goes to the effort of establishing new distribution channels. And I think Image is also unlikely to walk. And that will probably come down to simple loyalty. After all, Diamond has pushed Image pretty hard over the years, and with DC gone, Image is the second biggest fish in the small previews pond. So who will take the plunge? Listed in no particular order, but in turn, I think Archie Comics, Boom Studios, Dark Horse Comics, Fantagraphics, Oni Press, Valiant, and Viz. <laughs> Effectively, everybody. <laughs> Some of those companies will go hat in hand to Lunar. Some will take the Alterna self-publishing route. Some will seek out other means we can only guess at right now. And, and some may even go all digital. But one by one, I think they will get out while the getting is good. Which leads us to... Number three. Diamond is done. Yes, by this time next year, I predict diamond distribution will be a thing of the past. I mean, let's face it. Its systems are antiquated. Its leadership is tired. Its employees careless. And so at this point, there's just no escaping what's to come. Diamond has crossed the event horizon. There is no coming back, no way to save it, and nobody to save it. Because, frankly, it would be easier and cheaper for somebody to start a new distribution company from scratch than to try and right the sinking ship that is Diamond. And so Diamond, it's stuck deep in the gravity well of corporate demise. It will soon disappear down into the black hole of history, never to be seen again. Number four. Dynamite goes boom. <laughs> because when Diamond goes down, it will take a few other companies with it. You can bet on that. And those will be companies that were either too slow to jump ship or else missed the lifeboat and landed in shark-infested waters. Now, one such company will be Dynamite Entertainment, which I think will misread the fan base. When readers are seeking out good comics, Dynamite will still cater to collectors, placing all of its financial hopes in the continued churning of multiple alternate covers to comics that, frankly, <laughs> aren't all that good inside. Eventually, Dynamite will break the space-time continuum by attempting to print not 10, not 20, not 50, but an infinite number of alternate covers to some future issue of Vampirella, and the entire company will collapse under its own weight. Number 5 Similarly, IDW Publishing also will not survive to Comic-Con 2021. And really, this may be the safest prediction on this list, because IDW is carrying such a weight load, lots of people have been forsoothing its demise for a while now. Unfortunately, on top of its debt, IDW's business plan seems to have counted on licensing properties to a movie industry that is not functioning right now and in getting itself sold to investors who are not buying. So, bye-bye, IDW. Number 6 
And with IDW's demise, the Disney license will go to, where else? Marvel. Now, I think Marvel will only produce two ongoing Disney titles, most likely Uncle Scrooge and Walt Disney Comics and Stories, and those will still be domestic reprints of material originally produced for overseas markets. But there will likely be a plethora of miniseries and specials with both new and reprinted material. However, I suspect the Marvel Disney comics will be branded under the banner of something other than simply Disney comics. And this will be so that Marvel can publish as part of that line kid-friendly properties owned by Disney that are not part of the traditional Mickey Donald Goofy wheelhouse. Things like the Muppets or Peter Porker or the various Pixar characters. Now, I would have predicted this would be a revival of Marvel's old Star Comics line, but Disney Star is apparently a streaming service that's set to launch as a kind of Disney Plus app for foreign markets. So the name could be Disney Magic or Disney Kingdom or something like that, with Marvel branding also appearing on the cover. We'll see what it might be, but until then, on to... Number 7. Over the next year, comic book publishers will pursue the casual readers lost decades ago. So, no more focusing all of their publishing efforts on, you know, enticing the same dwindling base of aging fanboys to buy more comic books with fancy paper and high-end coloring and crisscross continuity and mega-important multi-title events. Instead, publishers will drive hard at the casual buyer. The kind of kids, yes, kids who may read comics for a few years and then outgrow them with nary a thought of saving those comics in pristine mint condition. They will no longer cater to a market that buys comics for the sole purpose of sending them unread directly to CGC. What they want is casual consumers who've never even heard of a Mylar bag wouldn't bother to buy a pack if they had. Now, I think DC is going to lead this charge, and that's because it's already been the one to move most aggressively in that direction. And and yes, uh, it's going to do that mostly, uh, perhaps even primarily through the, you know, the young adult graphic novels through Scholastic. Uh, But I'm talking more about the the regular mainstream comic book market, the, the floppies. So how is DC and then following other publishers going to do this? Well, three ways. One, they know they need to attract casual readers, and that means they need to go back to the future, or more correctly, forward to the past. They need to publish comics that are disposable consumer goods, the kinds of things that kids and parents would buy on impulse, with no more thought to long-term preservation than they'd give to saving a box of Captain Crunch once the cereal has been eaten. And that means newsprint. And behind the scenes, it means cutting unnecessary overhead. So no more associate editors and assistant editors and group editors and 28 different people with the word marketing in their title and 43 different vice presidents for the company. DC will shift from its current corporate structure, which can only be described as too many chiefs and not enough Indians, into something that is more focused on the actual production of the comic books. So all of this will be with an eye toward the goal of getting the cover price of a 32-page monthly comic book down below 3 and preferably $2. And along with this, DC will also make sure new readers can actually recognize what they see on the comic book when they buy a book they can finally afford. And that means they will publish only the most iconic versions of their biggest characters as seen on TV or in the movies. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean, you know, the whole line is going to be Batman and Justice League, but it's going to be characters that people, normies, man on the street, recognizes, and generally because of other media. So Aquaman will begin to look a lot more like underwater Conan. Superman will lose his wedding ring and his son. Green Lantern will probably be Jon Stewart. Iris West will be black. Joe West will go from being an abusive father to the loving hero who raised Barry Allen. Now, this approach is not new. Jimmy Olsen, Perry White, The Daily Planet, The Batcave, and even Skinny Alfred, all of these things were developments adopted into the comic books from other media. But, you know, hey, if you still want your Joe West to be a bad dad, if you want the Super Sons or a sleek blonde Aquaman, those books will still exist just exclusively to the comic shops. I'm talking about books that DC will try and get in front of people who don't even know comic shops exist. 
So I think DC is going to cleave its line in two. In his prediction video, Perch said he thought DC would shrink its line to something like 30 titles. I'm going to go with between 40 and 50. But what I foresee is about half of that number, whatever it ends up being, getting aimed at a general audience via Walmarts or other high traffic outlets, with the other half being exclusive to comic book stores. And this, what I'm calling the normie line, will be monthly titles featuring the most iconic versions of the DC characters, as I've said. So Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Flash, Green Lantern, probably Stargirl. And there'll also be larger anthologies with those characters plus backups and reprints. So action, detective, sensation, flash, all-American, and adventure comics like that. Meanwhile, the direct sale line will feature almost any continuity. It'll be limited almost exclusively to miniseries and specials. And by and large, it will look in format much like the current Black Label imprint with a similar price point. So basically, think of it like this. For the most part, Earth-1 will exist at Walmart. The rest of the multiverse you find at the comic shops. And along with that, the general audience line will feel a lot more like the comics of the Silver and Bronze Ages, with tight, single-title continuity, compressed plotting, and stories that are generally done in one, or, or at least that go on for no more than two or, at most, three issues. The exclusive line to the comic shops will read pretty much as comic books do now, but they will be a better value comparatively to what you see now, uh, just by virtue of being in a larger, lengthier format. So, there you go. <laughs> I admit I packed quite a bit into that prediction, into prediction number seven, but then I also admit that if I get any of that right, I absolutely will claim prediction number seven was a hit, a correct prediction. So... <laughs> Let's narrow the focus again with number eight. I keep referencing Walmarts, but DC's Normie line will not exist there in its current form, I don't think. Instead, I predict the rise of comic book vending machines. Now, the reason for this is a simple one. The current Walmart books are something of a failure. They're stocked in a collectible section that's actually half of a checkout lane, so nobody goes there except the people there to check out. Not even the fanboys who buy the kind of things that are stocked in that lane go there because the aisle is the same height as the cash registers. You can't bend over to see what's on the low shelves without sticking your ass in the face of somebody there to ring out. But a vending machine placed in the Walmart lobby, that solves that problem and a few others. Because, as other YouTubers have rightly pointed out, AT&T does not care about DC Comics apart from the merchandising potential of its intellectual property. AT&T does not want to sell Superman comic books. It wants to make Superman movies, it wants to sell Superman t-shirts, Superman bedsheets, Superman lunchboxes, Superman toys, Superman brand suppositories. <laughs> <laughs> but to do all that, AT&T needs people to recognize Superman outside of seeing a major motion picture once every three or four years. Because the thing is, while movies and TV shows do fuel merchandising, they do so only in significant peaks and valleys at the release of that movie. Think about it. How much Battlestar merch have you bought lately? Ghostbusters? The Lone Ranger? Not a lot, right? And what if it takes a while to get that movie made? Or it doesn't seem worth the multi-million dollar cost? Well, then the IP you own is effectively dead, and the merchandising dollars dry up because people have forgotten about the property. In the last year, have you bought your kid anything with Casper on it? How about Underdog? The A-Team? Uh-uh. And what if your movie tanks, right? What then? Warner Pictures could start production right now on a new Harley Quinn movie, but only because it has plausible creative deniability, because it could convincingly say that the Birds of Prey movie, hey, was quote-unquote just one take on the Harley character. But without Harley starring in comic books on a regular basis, she'd be as dead as Charlie's Angels. Because <laughs> it's a pretty safe bet you will not see another Charlie's Angels movie in your lifetime. Not for another 10 or 20 years anyway. And that means all that merchandising is gone for that time frame. Yes, it means nobody is going to be busting down your door to license Charlie's Angels until that next movie a generation from now. So, bottom line, running an IP farm is not as simple as planting seeds and selling produce. There's a step of care and cultivation in between that is very, very important. Or, to put it another way, as a merchandising opportunity to be viable, 
you must be visible. Say that again. It's important. To be viable, you must be visible. And when compared to the costs and risks of making a movie or producing a TV show, comic books are a super easy, super cheap way of maintaining that public visibility, of protecting copyrights and testing new ideas. And that's where vending machines come in. For the one-time cost of a single motion picture, amortized over several years, AT&T could invest in a means to keep its IP in the public consciousness for 30 years to come before those machines would need to be replaced. And with tens of thousands of people swarming in and out of Walmarts nationwide every day, hundreds of thousands even, maybe millions, those machines almost don't even have to dispense a single comic book. They just have to be there screaming, Hey kids, DC Comics! And the kids will scream, Mommy, I want a DC comic. Well, that's enough so that the next time Mommy goes to Walmart, she'll think, hey, Junior sure does like Superman. I should get him that Superman lampshade. And the next time you put out a Superman movie, everybody will be curious to see it because they'll know Superman is still a thing. Unlike now, you tell somebody you collect comic books and they look at you like you've got two heads and they ask, in deadpan seriousness, they still make those? <laughs> and here's the thing. Instead of creating animosity, with comic shops the way the recent Walmart giant books did, DC could contract with local comic book stores to stock and maintain those vending machines. And presuming each book is dispensed in a bag and board, the local comic shop owner could stick a flyer for his store in every bag, maybe even some other local advertising he or she could sell, you know, that wouldn't have means or need to advertise in the actual comic book itself. So even though they would lose half the DC line to these vending machines, the stores would have a financial stake in seeing them succeed. And while I expect DC would be the one to lead the way, as I've said, might even have the first vending machine examples on display at Comic-Con 2021, I expect machines branded to Marvel and other companies would soon follow suit. And of course, the Marvel vending machines would be in every hotel lobby, in every Disney theme park, <laughs> and probably someplace else, Target or something like that. Okay, so I think that's as far as we're going to get with the predictions this time out. I don't want this video to go on too, too long. So come back for part two when I will tell you all about the rise of a new comic book publisher, one that may well outsell Marvel and DC. Until then, as always, goodbye, good luck, and please be good to each other.